Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for folks to filter in as we get started here at the top of the hour. Good morning and welcome. Great to see everybody. And we'll go ahead and get things started. Beth and Tracy, I'll turn things over to you. Great. Welcome everyone. Um, I, we are expecting uh, a, a decent group today. We're expecting about 40 folks joining us. So um, we'll let people come in, but we will get started. Um, and we'll, um, I'm going to kick us off. So thank you for joining us today and making time and space for the learning and dialogue about public health. Um, we are among fellow ECCF donors and some institutional funders who care about the needs in Essex County and the great work being done here in our region. So I want to I want to welcome everyone. I'm Beth Francis. Uh, I'm CEO of Essex County Community Foundation. And on behalf of ECCF, uh, the Peter and Elizabeth Tower Foundation and Philanthropy Massachusetts, who partners, um, we'd all like to welcome you today to the session. If this is your first time at an Essex County Funder Summit, um, welcome. Um, but I'm looking around the Zoom room um, and pressing our the forward button to see all the people that are coming in right now. Um, and there's many of you who have joined us before. So thanks for joining us again today. ECCF, Tower, and Philanthropy Mass work really collaboratively on many efforts, but this biannual Funder Summit is our favorite to plan because it gives us a chance to learn together, but it also equally important is it gives us a chance to network and meet others in the philanthropy space. So we're really excited for today. We have a full agenda um, in our virtual world um, that includes a presentation by Lindsay Tucker, um, Associate Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, we'll learn about pressing public, issue, public health issues that are facing our region, um, and it'll be grounded in data from our indicators platform, impactessexcounty.org, um, which is a data website that we have at ECCF. Um, and we'll also have the opportunity to meet in breakout groups to dive deeper into the role that philanthropy can play in supporting public health efforts in the future. So let me introduce Tracy Sawicki, Executive Director of the Tower Foundation. She's going to kick us off on our topic and our plans for today. Great. Thank you, Beth. And a warm welcome from all of us at the Tower Foundation. And we're so glad to have you here with us today. So let me start with public health. What is it? Is it important? Why should we care, right? The average person, the average everyday person didn't really think about public health before COVID struck. You know, however, certain sectors in our communities like our cities, our towns, our schools and healthcare have always understood the important role of public health. But the average person, not so much. But after COVID, perhaps maybe they should. So public health, most of you know, is the science and art of promoting health, preventing disease, and prolonging life through organized efforts of a society. And so we all witnessed firsthand our public health officials and the public health system advancing these goals as they led and supported efforts to combat the pandemic. And yet public health has been grossly under-resourced for decades and making the response to the pandemic a significant lift for public health systems around the country and in Essex County. And the sector knew this was a growing issue, yet it really took a pandemic for the impact of this reality to sink in throughout all of our communities. So COVID has amplified the need for change and created the conditions and opportunities to make them. And we've heard this from those within the public health sector and beyond. And so for example, there's more awareness about issues of community health than perhaps before. There's a state roadmap for change and potential ARPA and infrastructure funding that can advance solutions 
and a more willingness for us to work collaboratively across the public sector than ever before. So today is about dedicating time and space, as Beth said, to learn and listen and think collectively. And we even might learn about how we could co-fund, what opportunities are there to do this, ways to coordinate effort and work together more deeply. So let's get started. Um, I think the program is going to be really robust and very informative, and I'm going to turn it over to Carol Schuster, who is going to get us started. Hi, good morning, and everyone, and thanks, Beth and Tracy, for queuing up the conversation. As Tracy said, we have a really robust program for you today, and to ensure that we can share as many perspectives as possible, we have experimented with doing some video vignettes of folks in the field. So now we're going to share a short uh, video perspective from Kiami Mahanian from Lynn Community Health, Karen Carroll, who's with us on the call, and Dr. Guy Fish from the Greater Lawrence Family Center. We queued up the conversation. You know, when we talk about public health, there's so many aspects of the conversation, but we really wanted to synthesize their perspectives. So the key things that we asked them were, what are you seeing and hearing in the community? naming the issues and opportunities that they see, what do you need in order to serve your community, and where are your hopes for the future? I'm going to stop sharing and have my teammate Megan share our first video. And if folks can just remember to turn up your volume so that you can hear, that would be great. Um, that the system is not actually set up to allow poor people to actually be able to get out of poverty. There's an increasing fear that uh, the status quo is really operating for people with education or people who have resources. And I think there's a very basic fear that no matter how hard you or your children work, uh, it won't be enough to escape poverty. Obviously, the uncertainty surrounding COVID is heightening this. People don't know if they will be able to um, have what they would consider a normal life. And they don't know what kind of changes are coming. One of the advantages of public health is that there's no dearth uh, of opportunity for things to improve. In my role as a leader of a community health center that's embedded within a community. I would say that the number one issue that troubles me is our workforce development. Uh, I think that uh, our educational system has not yet necessarily caught up to the needs of society. And I think that in Lynn, we actually have some resources that other institutions might not have. I think increasing the support, the visibility, um, and the status of vocational training uh, is really a much needed uh, aspect. The second biggest need that I would probably point out is a stronger public infrastructure. And this goes in many different directions, but I believe a stronger public health system would make an immense difference. Stronger public transportation would make an immense difference. Stronger things like you may not think of it as health, but I think a stronger public defender uh, system is also something uh, that would help and obviously and desperately uh, a really significant investment in public housing. I think there is a true passion uh, in the community, in the workforce, in our staff within the community health center, in the young people that I interact with. There's clearly a hunger to have a society, to have a set of principles that works for everybody. I see a greater willingness amongst uh, leaders and stakeholders, be it in public service, uh, in politics, uh, leaders of nonprofit, leader of for-profit institutions. I really see that there's a greater hunger to really take responsibility uh, for this idea that people can only take advantage of opportunities if they're there. And it's our job to really make sure that opportunities are available to everyone. I can say that what I see right now in our communities is a growing awareness around the health inequities that we face. And I think this happened during COVID where these inequities that have always been there were exacerbated at levels that we have never seen before. And we also realized the interconnectedness of us all during COVID 
and that if some people were not staying healthy, then none of us were. And so I feel that there is this raised awareness, this collective awareness and vocabulary around what it really means to be healthy and what that would take and look like in our communities. These are all the things that we saw such a difference in our communities based on people who had good internet and who didn't. We also saw our homeless members of our community dying at double the rate of the rest of the population. So again, our most vulnerable members of our society were affected. It also depended on what kind of work you did and whether you had sick time or whether you were an hourly worker and couldn't get paid if you didn't show up at work. All of these things contributed to the spread of the disease and how well certain populations of our community endured the pandemic by raising the level of health for our most vulnerable members, we will raise it for all of us. And I'm optimistic that we can do that with the support of funders like yourself. Thank you and have a great day. What we're seeing in Lawrence and neighboring communities is largely gratitude by our patients for being seen and heard more so than pre-pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has shown a light on the issues that they have been facing for many, many years. And they are grateful that these uh, needs are finally being addressed uh, as the pandemic has called out social drivers of health. Um, a significant issue that we've been dealing with is behavioral health. Uh, it came to the forefront in Lawrence with the altercations that our students at the high school had with their teachers. But we see them as canaries in a coal mine. Uh, demonstrating the stress, the anxiety that they've been under, particularly as uh, social drivers such as uh, eviction and joblessness and um, food insecurity have created a lot of stress. Uh, we are dealing with ways in which to improve our provisioning of behavioral health services here, and uh, but also refocusing on health equity overall which means addressing all of those upstream issues that have dri that drive our community members to these points of, of despair and poorer health. Uh, what we really uh, are looking for is, um, in many ways, practice transformation. Uh, there are any number of ways in which we can do a better job collectively with other community-based organizations if we are sharing data and information about the services uh, that our community members are receiving and alert them to other needs that they may have, if we can track and follow them better. Uh, the kinds of, of tools that are necessary to do this effectively are, are data analytics and, um, again, partnership with com other community-based organizations. Um, on, and particularly as we move into uh, a new ACO waiver, uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, and capitation or subcapitation for primary care, uh, having the assistance of organizations to do practice transformation uh, will be critical. Thank you. A big thank you again to Drs. Mahanian and Fish, as well as Karen Carroll for their perspectives. As you can see, there's this interconnectedness across the work of everything that we do that's encompassed under public health. And as funders, it's really important that we're part of this collaborative process. And I think COVID has presented this real opportunity to explore the ways in which philanthropy can be a part of public health in, in ways that it really never has before. Certainly we at ECCF have had that opportunity to explore as have you, many of you. And so the unique opportunity we have here today as institutional, individual and other types of funders, we can look collectively at the opportunities as outlined in this first video. Now we have an opportunity, a really exciting opportunity to hear from the DPH's Associate Commissioner, Lindsay Tucker, who's going to share with us really the landscape of public health um, and the opportunities that lie ahead. So I'm going to turn things over to you, Lindsay. Carol, thank you so much. 
I am going to share my screen. Um, can folks see that? Okay, great. Um, so good morning. Uh, thank you so much for including me today. It's really exciting for me to be here with you and to have this opportunity to talk to you. My name is Lindsay Tucker. As Carol said, I'm the Associate Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And in our short time together this morning, I am going to provide a brief overview of um, DPH's approach to health equity and share some specifics of our work uh, to address current epidemics and then speak about partnering with philanthropy and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. So uh, at DPH, our uh, vision is optimal health and well-being for all people in Massachusetts, supported by strong public health infrastructure and healthcare delivery. And um, this is our house. This is what we call a DPH, our house. And it really um, provides our mission and our vision, but then also uh, the, the principles and the values that we use to do our work uh, every day. And so um, when we think about what supports that vision and the mission that you can see there. It's the pillars of data determinants and disparities. And for me, this really echoes the message that we just heard from some of the leaders in the video around how they think about health, how they think about public health, how they think about meeting the needs of their communities. Um, so we, uh, we really think about data as the grounding point for understanding what is happening in our communities uh, to individuals and families, and then more importantly, at the population level. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, social determinants um, briefly, as well as disparities, but this is where we really think of the core of our work. So you may know um, that just recently and uh, for some years, Massachusetts has ranked the highest in health uh, in the nation and um, highest for well-being in 2020, according to a BU School of Public Health report, um, and that we have consistently been in kind of the top two, top three um, in a national rankings report. And we're really proud of that. Um, and you should be too for the way that you have contributed to supporting health in your communities. But we know that when we look under the averages and we look at the data and we look at communities, that that uh, level of health outcome and health achievement is not true for everybody in Massachusetts. And there are really different outcomes um, based on uh, who people are and where they live. And more and more uh, in the past decade or decades, we understand that that's not about your genes and it's not about your health behavior, and it's not even really about your relationship with your doctor. The greatest impact on your health is something called the social determinants of health. And this is that middle pillar where we live, grow, work, play, pray. Um, and that is really what contributes uh, to health inequities. And uh, an overarching or even underpinning social determinant is structural racism and how that impacts uh, our communities and people's lived experience in those communities, what opportunities are available to them, how they experience uh, stress, how that stress gets into their bodies and the multi-generational impact of that. And so when we think about the work that we are doing, we want to think um, about those communities who have been disproportionately impacted in a different way. Look at those disparities, look at those differences, understand where those differences are unjust, and that is where those disparities really turn into inequities. And that unjustness, um, that is where we want the core of our work to be uh, and where I would encourage you to continue uh, to focus and to continue to do your work. So uh, what we see is that um, because of these social determinants of health, because of structural racism, the communities that are disproportionately impacted with a certain health outcome are the communities that are disproportionately impacted by most health outcomes. And so I'm going to talk about COVID, I'm going to talk about the opioid epidemic, I'm going to talk about gun violence. And you know um, that the communities in Essex that are disproportionately impacted are the same, um, whether we are talking about any of those or obesity or diabetes or teen pregnancy um, or food insecurity or housing instability. And so thinking about the, the intersections of those pieces. Um, I also wanted to 
loop back just very briefly to an infrastructure point that was mentioned earlier on the call. Um, and I think as you probably know in, in Essex County, public health infrastructure is very diverse. You have large city health departments in Lynn and Lawrence, and you also have some rural communities uh, that don't have much other than a part-time uh, health agent or public health nurse. Uh, but no matter the size, uh, Massachusetts communities don't have enough capacity to fulfill the mandatory obligations of what we see for public health. Um, and so what we are doing in our Office of Local and Regional Health is providing resources to support all of your communities um, to build capacity for public health services and shared infrastructure. And so I just did want to say that as we talk about the landscape for public health, we recognize that there has been enough has not been enough investment or infrastructure. And um, we are seeking to grow that and improve that. But that is also a space where your partnership um, is really welcome and valued. We are supporting uh, 17 communities in Essex County through our uh, shared services grant program. And that's again, to build capacity and to um, help those communities better serve their residents. Um, for the remaining uh, Essex County communities who are not part of that shared services grant program, um, the Essex uh, Community Foundation or any of you uh, could serve as a convener to help in that space and to help bring those communities together uh, to encourage those conversations and discussions to collaborate. Um, and our, our Office of Local and Regional Health would be very happy to work with you on that if that is of interest. So as I mentioned, um, and moving now uh, to the next slide, our focus at DPH is really about understanding the averages, looking below them to appreciate the inequities. And one of the resources that I wanted to share with you today for your use, if you are interested, is something called the Public Health Information Tool or FIT. And in this, um, a dashboard, um, we have different data sets coming together so that you can look at geographies, you can look at populations and you can understand those different health outcomes and how they intersect. So throughout my talk today, um, I'm just gonna give you a couple of different resources in case you do wanna follow up, get more information, share with your colleagues uh, to be understanding um, what is happening in your communities and what impact you can have. So turning to COVID, um, which has been top of mind for so many of us for so many um, months now, um, DPH has been working from the beginning to provide information um, and then working uh, around vaccine and uh, working even more recently around therapeutics. Um, I do see that there's a chat coming in, but I will hold that until the end, um, just because there's only so many things I can focus on on Zoom at the same time. Um, but I do see that, and thank you. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to highlight is something called our COVID-19 Vaccine Equity Initiative. And we have worked with the 20 communities across the Commonwealth most disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, and some of those are in Essex County. So Haverhill, Lawrence, Lynn, Thuin, those are communities that we have been working very closely with for over a year now to increase awareness of the vaccine and again uh, subsequently therapeutics and um, other uh, resources um, work to increase acceptance um, among communities who may have had uh, initially low interest in the vaccine uh, but most importantly access. Um, we know for most people who did not get the vaccine early or even who still have not had it um, or have, have not yet gotten their booster. Often it, it is about access and it's about the ability of folks um, to find time through multiple jobs or childcare or to find a place that they feel comfortable due to immigration status or language uh, or transportation. And that can be because someone is an immigrant, because someone has a disability, um, because someone um, is aging and is not able um, to easily leave their home to get um, a vaccine. And so we have been working with uh, partners um, within Essex County, uh, community-based organizations, as well as community health centers and providers to really meet people where they are, to help um, them in their language and to provide them with resources, whether it is childcare, whether it is a translator, whether it is um, a trusted religious leader who can talk through some questions around um, getting the vaccine whether it's an Uber um, or, or another transportation method that um, folks feel comfortable with. And we have seen uh, results um, from this and uh, 
just in Haverhill, for example, um, a year ago, vaccine was incredibly low in all of our communities, um, but now 72% um, of folks in Haverhill have been vaccinated and we're very proud of, of this increase. Um, so if you wanna see details about within each of those municipalities, who the partners are, um, where the dollars are going, um, also directly to uh, the local boards of health in those municipalities, the link there to the vaccine equity initiative um, can provide you with that information. And then um, the community COVID impact survey is something that I am so proud of. Uh, this was a resource um, that uh, we started uh, making public over a year ago. We fielded a massive survey in the Commonwealth in the fall of 2020 to really understand what was happening in communities around COVID and how it was disproportionately impacting different folks. And we, um, we used a different approach and we worked hand in hand with local communities, local community-based organizations, multiple languages to help um, really bring in greater responses from communities that frequently we don't get high enough response rates to really do analysis. And so those are folks who may identify as LGBTQ, may, may identify as um, Native American or indigenous population, may identify as folks with a disability, and most importantly, the intersectionality of those um, identities so that we could really understand what was happening. Um, and so if you go and you click on that link um, and we'll send these slides out or I'll defer to Megan and Carol, but um, we can, all of this you can Google and, and easily find. Uh, you can take a look and um, look by geography and also look by population understanding um, folks who are young parents, um, folks who work in a particular industry and really get a sense of what's happening in your, your community and then what you um, might uh, want to, um, to do about it. Um, and again, there are um, specific vignettes on the VEI website about what's happening um, in the, the various communities. So now I'm gonna to turn uh, to the opioid epidemic um, because that is something that predated COVID. It existed throughout COVID. In fact, it got worse during COVID um, and now is still with us. We just released uh, a week or so ago, um, our most recent opioid data. You can find it on mass.gov um, backslash opioid. Uh, we update this now um, a couple times a year, but the most recent data now is very fresh. Um, and we know that, um, Again, as I had said, uh, unfortunately, um, the opioid epidemic has gotten worse during COVID uh, through isolation, through stress, um, through all of the ways in which we know um, mental health has been impacted. Um, and so, and we even saw that through the COVID Community Impact Survey. Um, so the data that you can see here, uh, you can see that, and you may have seen the press about it in the last week or so, but there's um, nearly a 10% increase um, in, in deaths. Um, and you will see at the bottom row that um, Essex County is pulled out. And so you can see the data there too, um, that uh, devastatingly, um, we have we are continuing to experience um, these, these deaths. And so from um, 253 individuals, and obviously these are people, these are um, sons, daughters, um, family members, friends, uh, in, two, in 2020 to 289 in 2021, and that's a 14% increase. Um, we did see a brief dip um, in 2020 from uh, 2019, so it's actually very similar um, to where that was, uh, but I did just wanna call that out. Um, we are doing an incredible amount at DPH and across the state uh, for the opioid epidemic. Currently, Essex County has a wide array of treatment services available, including seven opioid treatment centers, five syringe services programs, three recovery support centers, and five office-based opioid treatment centers. Um, we are actively increasing access to all FDA-approved medication by lowering as many barriers as possible. Um, and ensuring that this life-saving and evidence-based treatment is available widely. And one program that I did wanna highlight that we are also very proud of is our Black and Latino Men's Reentry Program. This is a culturally specific reentry program tailored to Black and Latino men at greater risk of overdose post-incarceration. And this um, really innovative program is cited at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center and um, in conjunction with the Lynn um, Community Health Center. So I encourage you to learn more about the trends statewide and, and also for you in Essex County, again, at that website. So we have talked about the opioid epidemic. We have talked about the COVID pandemic. 
And another epidemic um, certainly uh, that we think of is, is racism as a public health issue. And one of the ways that that shows up is violence. Um, and gun violence has been um, so top of mind for us so recently, um, but we have been seeing that in our communities um, for such a long time. And so I did wanna talk briefly uh, about our gun violence prevention program. Um, we continue to work uh, really rigorously with partners on finding solutions to the root cause uh, root causes of gun violence in Massachusetts, and frankly, they're similar to what's happening across the country. Um, we see those as uh, really driving in many ways from structural racism, um, looking at systemic barriers uh, to equitable housing, um, to education, um, and to health that really create um, a disproportionate burden specifically on, on Black uh, and Brown communities and, and really men um, of color. And so we work um, through our gun violence prevention program. Uh, we partner um, and we fund local organizations. Uh, in Essex, there are three. Uh, UTEC is in Lawrence um, and Haverhill, and they work with young adults with a history of incarceration, serious criminal or gang involvement. And then ROCA and Lynn, um, working specifically with young adults, um, men who are at uh, high risk for future long-term adult criminal justice involvement. Um, and we also fund UTEC to be a technical assistance center and best practices um, center. And so that's on the right side of the screen if you want more information. Um, but we are really doing this dual um, programming, uh, helping communities with community mobilization around the root cause and working individually with those youth um, and with those um, uh, men and women to address um, the impacts of those structural root causes and drivers. So how can we help them with education, um, with building their skills uh, for workforce, with their mental health, connecting them to a behavioral health provider. Um, so those are various things that we um, are doing uh, in that space. And then finally, uh, I did just wanna turn more directly to you and what are the ways in which um, philanthropy can really uh, not just augment um, and support public health, but in a more um, innovative and unique way, there is such an incredible role for philanthropy. I think um, you all are such leaders in your community and you provide incredible knowledge of specific um, populations within their community, what their needs are and how to directly meet their needs. And my hope is that some of the resources that I have been presenting over the course of this talk can help you um, better understand those needs. Um, but just yesterday, actually, I was on a phone call with um, some of our federal uh, HHS partners and some of our um, local New England states, and we were talking about, um, specifically for COVID, COVID and actually older adults, um, how it has been hard to get funding out quickly because of the restrictions that we have in our federal and state funding, um, how many requirements there are. Um, how detailed the applications have to be, how much capacity an organization has to have in order to apply for that, to track the funding, to report to us. And I think one of the ways um, that philanthropy can be such um, a partner in this space is by providing more nimbleness, um, more flexibility, uh, different um, and, and ideally decreased levels um, of, of that complexity in order to apply for funding and report on funding. Um, and so a couple of the places that I did want to flag uh, for uh, ways that we can have kind of greater collective impact, philanthropy, private sector, and other spaces, healthcare, um, and government, the Vaccine Equity Initiative for me was a great space. Um, I, I heard from Carol and Megan some of the ways that you have supported um, vaccine clinics. Um, you provide uh, the venue and we provide the, um, the vaccine and we are very happy to come to you. Again, you know your communities, uh, you can bring folks together um, and we are happy to provide, um, again, not only the clinical support, but the other sort of navigational support um, and thinking about how we can, we can help um, bring uh, boosters and now um, uh, vaccine for, for younger kids uh, out to communities. Um, Mass in Motion is a really exciting program that has been around for a long time, and it actually started with private philanthropy as part of it. Um, over time, uh, um, foundations have shifted out of that, but we would welcome um, additional collaboration with Mass in Motion. Um, I put the website up there if you want to look. It really is looking at, again, social determinants of health, specifically uh, the built environment, to look at ways that communities um, can work together to make policy change, to have 
safer streets, more bike lanes, um, more stable housing, more access to food security, um, so that those downstream health outcomes, um, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, uh, can really be changed, um, not by um, uh, not by going to the doctor, not by um, necessarily having um, diabetes treated, but before the diabetes happens, making sure that folks have access, um, again, to healthy foods and um, to safe spaces for exercise. Uh, so that's the Mass in Motion program. And they are really using a racial equity lens now as they think about um, how they are funding and how, are they, how they are supporting communities. Um, in a very similar way, the Massachusetts Community Health and Aging Funds uh, is a space where we are um, working with a, a private um, organization called Health Resources in Action and grant making out to communities specifically um, around the social determinants of health, uh, both broadly and for the aging um, and elder population. And if that's a space that you are interested in, um, more, more information is online um, at that website. So I, uh, I do just want to end here so that we can ask um, if you have questions, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk through. Uh, but again, just wanted to reference that those spaces that I think philanthropy can be so key is providing um, unique knowledge of your communities, um, really bringing more nimbleness, flexibility, and creativity to the space of addressing those needs, and then um, collaborating with us on sharing that message and what is that collective impact that we can do across sector. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen if I can remember how to do that. Um, and thank you all so much for uh, the time and for the, uh, the conversation. And so now I see that first question, do cities and towns pay for local public health departments and their work or does the state fund those budgets? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so it really varies by community. Um, it's a lot of uh, tax dollars. So I, I live in Boston and um, we have a massive public health department that is funded by the city, uh, but there are um, also state grants and federal grants that fund um, uh, municipalities. And we at DPH um, have a lot of money that flows sometimes from large foundations or the federal government from us to local uh, municipalities. With the vaccine equity initiative in particular, we did get out um, a couple million dollars to the local, um, local boards of health from us to support their work on the ground. And some of them used it to pay for an epidemiologist. Some of it used, some of them used it to pay for a nurse to give vaccines. Um, some of them um, used it for language translation um, or doing a much more localized health messaging campaign. Um, so it, it is very much um, a blend of funding. Um, and it does really vary across um, geographies based on size and, uh, and capacity. It's a great question, thank you. Other questions? Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, front and center, um, absolutely. And so sorry, the question in case folks aren't reading it is um, where does behavioral health fit into DPH priorities? Um, so for, for those of you who um, know or work with um, our incredible secretary, Mary Lou Sutters, uh, you know that behavioral health is one of her top priorities. And um, that is very true uh, for us at DPH as well. And for us, it spans a few different um, spaces. Uh, certainly our Bureau of Substance Addiction Services focusing on the opioid epidemic as a core space around behavioral health. Um, we also have our suicide prevention program with, which sits within DPH. Um, and so we work very closely um, with uh, suicide prevention coalitions across the Commonwealth to provide training, education, supports, and um, intervention services. You may have seen some of the press recently around the 988 hotline. Um, nationally, we are moving toward like a 911 number, but 988 three digits that you can call um, and have uh, direct assistance for you. Um, and much of that will be staffed by folks here in Massachusetts. We already do have, um, our Bureau of Substance Addiction Services does have a helpline uh, for um, opioids and other um, um, substances, including alcohol, and uh, connected into that is our gambling, problem gambling services hotline. Um, so really recognizing the intersectionality and the comorbidity of these um, mental health challenges, uh, they, are, they are connected, um, but it is a, a core um, priority and we see it um, 
in the way also that we are working specifically with um, our school health, um, which is uh, in our school-based health centers and how we can be integrating behavioral health into all of the spaces that we work with youth, including actually, um, as I mentioned very briefly, our gun violence prevention program. Um, we uh, are requiring um, that they all have uh, behavioral health um, counselors um, to work with the youth um, and also work with the other, um, with their colleagues who are staffing the programs. So really trying to integrate um, behavioral health in, in much of our programming. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about that. I know I have a number of other questions, but I want to make sure we leave space. I see um, a hand raised by John Payson. Thanks, Carol, and uh, thanks, Lindsay, very much for this. Uh, one of the uh, topics of discussion at uh, Essex County Community Foundation on the COVID Relief Task Force um, was around the vaccination program where we were mobilizing local feet on the ground. Uh, Bernadette was involved in that, as was Carol. Uh, to try to get outreach at you know on that last mile to the individual uh, client and uh, one of my colleagues on the committee observed that we had this infrastructure in place that uh, ECCF had worked so hard to put together. Was there a way to continue to run program through it so that we wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be dismantled through uh, you know disuse af after COVID if there is such a thing as after COVID and I wondered if there are opportunities to partner with uh, DPH uh, and to keep that last mile uh, service structure in place and fund it. John, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. What we are um, looking at is what are those things that happened during COVID that we want to sustain? Um, and really, as you, as you are referencing, to integrate into the work moving forward. So in our vaccine equity initiative, we um, very quickly wanted to get money out, wanted to be funding organizations um, to, to do, whether it's outreach and navigation or the actual vaccination. And we funded um, a network of pr providers that we already had through our Office of HIV and AIDS, um, because they are already doing a lot of, or they were already doing, still are, um, uh, direct uh, community work, um, taking vans out, um, being out in the community. Um, some of those are our community health centers, um, seeing people at their main site, but also again, kind of uh, remotely being out. And so what better way um, to, to bring vaccine to people than by using those, um, uh, those tools and all of those individuals who are so well-trained know their communities so well. Then we also saw that some of those providers were doing similar work in the opioid space. They were doing direct outreach um, in a van, um, going to homeless encampments, going to spaces that um, have individuals that don't feel comfortable um, going to a community health center in the same way or a hospital um, or um, certainly some of the broader vaccine clinics. And so we have um, these spaces that historically have been a little bit siloed. How do we bring them together so that that last mile can be much more comprehensive and can be community health that looks at um, what do you need around uh, HIV? What do you need around opioid? What do you need around vaccine? What do you need around behavioral and mental health? And how do we um, uh, really sort of co-fund um, and, and blend and bridge some of our funding so that that work can continue um, and can continue in the way that meets people where they are. Um, there is, I don't think a post COVID, it is, it is just at what point does COVID become endemic? We're not quite there. Um, you know, we had thought that we would be there by now and COVID just keeps um, surprising us and keeping us on our toes. Uh, and so I think as we think about ways to integrate our last mile work, would love to continue partnering um, with you and with other community groups about how to maintain and sustain that um, and how to do it as um, the epidemic and other epidemics keep evolving. How do we continue to meet the needs, but build on how quickly we were able to do things, those partnerships that were developed and the trust that was really built at the community level um, with folks like you, with religious leadership, um, with municipal leadership and, and bringing those folks together. So again, thank you for the question. A uh, couple more hands raised, uh, but Carol, I'll, I'll let you um, lead. Yeah, uh, Beth, I think, and then Abby. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so what you just is what John just described and what you just described um, needs funding, right? And it certainly can be philanthropic dollars that support that. But I'm just wondering where the ARPA and the infrastructure, are there plans for some of this um, ARPA and infrastructure money to be able to support some of that continued systems building that would allow those things that you just talked about to happen? Um, and then, then we can figure out where, where philanthropy can come alongside that as well. So I was just curious if there's resource flows that, that you think are gonna be coming, whether that's through the federal government or the state government that will have that local impact. Beth, thank you. And I think that also relates to the thing that just, um, the thing, the, uh, the idea that just came through chat around workforce, because this is all connected. So we have, um, we have COVID money uh, that is, um, also uh, sort of simultaneous to the ARPA money. Um, and then there is a very large and very exciting um, public health infrastructure grant that just got released last week. And so we do have um, incredible, incredible supports coming in from the federal government to think about much longer term investments in um, public health uh, municipalities um, and building up capacity, building up infrastructure. And so I think one of the important conversations is what is that cross-sector connection? Um, what can and should municipalities be able to do? How do we build that local public health infrastructure and workforce? Um, what is at the community level, um, both in terms of community health care, the community health centers are our strongest um, resources for um, health in so many of these communities. And so how do we ensure um, that community health centers uh, are well-funded, are well-resourced? And then um, the CBOs that have those unique connections, um, cultural connections, and uh, really understand um, what the needs of their communities are. So I think, is it exactly as you said, Beth, it's really understanding um, what is coming in um, from ARPA, from the feds, from the states. Um, some of it is the shared services uh, grant program that I talked about briefly from our Office of Local and Regional Health. Um, and again, I'd be happy to connect you with Sam Wong. He is the former health director in Framingham, and we are so lucky that he is now with us at DPH. He's doing just really brilliant work and um, really thinking about how to support um, communities. And then um, we work very closely with the Mass League of Community Health Centers um, to help support them um, in working with um, CHCs. Uh, and then, um, so I think that the place for philanthropy is in some ways around the coalition building, bringing people together for these discussions and supporting that. Um, and then places, like I also mentioned earlier, where we um, may not be able to best support um, local and small organizations, how, how do we work with you to help perhaps kind of fill that in? Um, we are trying to do better training and capacity building for small organizations, um, but that will take time um, and that um, still may not be enough given the um, you know, complexities of, of the grants. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Abby and I'm gonna allow, um, this is really exciting, um, enriching um, opportunity to speak. So I'm gonna allow for a few more questions here and then we'll move into the next segment. I just don't wanna lose the opportunity to engage Lindsay in all this great information. So Abby, we'll move to you and then we'll allow for one more question um, that speaks to, I think, Bernadette and Jackie's questions about workforce. Thanks, Carol. And thank you so much, Lindsay. I really appreciated your um, presentation earlier. I'm wondering if, and this is somewhat similar to Beth's question, but I'm wondering if you have recommendations for um, how to identify those community-based organizations that are small and are really in need of some support that are doing work to try to address some of these, the systems level issues that we're seeing that are, um, you know, more upstream than the classic individual, you know, soup kitchen style um, nonprofit, but but the the work, the community mobilization, the capacity building, those types of things that could really benefit benefit from our funding, um, but are just hard to to find in the community. Thank you, Abby. Um, so in some ways, that's a question that I had brought to local funders during the EI because we felt like we knew the larger organizations and that it was 
local, um, particularly in the Worcester area, um, they kept saying like, the folks that we work with are not on your list. Like, why aren't they on your list? Um, but I think the flip of that is um, in, in terms of the, the more upstream policy work, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at um, the, the last link that I put, which is for the Community Health and Healthy Aging Funds, the organizations that have applied to those, um, to those grants are ones that are really interested. Some of it are very small dollars and some of it are much larger projects, but are really interested in community level work that is upstream, focusing on policy change, focusing on coalition building. Um, and so that could be a space for you to begin to, you may know all of those orgs, I don't know, um, but to begin to um, see some of the organizations that have expressed interest and are um, doing the work. We uh, had, our first year of funding two years ago, and then the second round of funding is just, um, the applications are out right now, we're just closed. Um, and so we should have more um, organizations, um, hopefully demonstrating interest and then getting funding. And I'd be happy to connect you um, also with the, the director of that program to, to learn more. Um, the, the workforce question, um, if I can just shift back to that briefly, um, thank you again, that's, uh, we have seen so much burnout in public health and behavioral health. Um, so many um, nurses and social workers and public health um, folks who have retired um, and, and just left because this, these two years have been so challenging. Um, and we didn't have a perfectly robust and complete workforce before COVID. So um, there are a number of workforce initiatives. Um, some of the more downstream work uh, that we do is we do have loan repayment um, and there's a behavioral health loan repayment program and also uh, for clinicians working uh, largely in community health centers and rural and underserved um, uh, populations across the Commonwealth. So that is something, but those folks have to have completed training and demonstrated interest. So again, that is downstream in terms of upstream, um, partnering with um, technical schools um, and uh, colleges in Massachusetts to try to um, build interest um, in incoming uh, students to uh, start in those fields. And then how can we support them um, through their training um, and through loan repayment and things like that. Um, so it, it, I think, is a many-year process um, to build to build this back up. Um, but I think it's it's partially the financial support, but it's really also partially the um, the peer support. Uh, the trauma that folks have endured over the past couple of years is just um, intense for for all of us in different ways. And so um, our uh, federal association, um, the Association of State and Territorial Health Workers, has been working. Um, with other um, agencies to, to really um, field multiple surveys and look at what has happened um, to the workforce and what supports could be put in place. Um, and it, it does include, um, again, peer supports, mentorship, and then some funding changes. Uh, so I don't think there's you know one, one solution. I don't even think there's like five or 10, um, but, but I do think thanks to um, this, infrastructure grant that's coming from the CDC and, and some of these other funding sources, hopefully we can really build back up um, the workforce at the state level and, and more importantly at the community level. That's great. We have time for one more question and then we're going to move into the next vignette and then have an opportunity to do some breakout spaces where we can dialogue further about the specific ways that we as funders can collaborate on all these great examples by Lindsay. So we have time for one more question. Any others? Looks like there's some questions in the chat. Um, Megan, thank you. I tried to talk about most of them. Um, a lot of it is on workforce. Yeah. Um, uh, Jessica, thank you for that comment. Um, I agree. We have really been trying um, to be more intentional and explicit about um, working with uh, leaders of color um, and working um, with folks with lived experience and um, and paying folks with lived experience who um, who speak with us, who provide technical assistance, who provide um, focus group advice. Um, one of the 
silver linings of COVID is how many meetings, um, you know, immediately went to virtual. And so suddenly transportation and childcare weren't such barriers to people participating. Um, but then uh, a way that we used to pay people to participate was funding um, their transportation. We could reimburse for parking and transit, but not for town. Um, and so that's just a little thing that we are working on to, to think about, you know, how do we really um, honor people's time and experience and um, demonstrate appropriately um, our, our respect um, for them and for that um, so that we can do our work better. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm grateful for your time. Uh, I will follow up with um, with Megan and Carol. Happy to connect any of you with uh, my colleagues who know much more than I do on all of these topics. Um, but really appreciate the opportunity to connect. Thank you, Lindsay. That was really excellent. Thank you. And I think it has many of our wheels turning on the call here. There's so much opportunity for interconnectedness and in, in all of our work. Um, we're going to move over into a brief vignette that we'll share as a segue um, our role as funders and some specific examples of how funders have come together to think about the future in the ways that we can specifically tackle some of these issues. I think the opportunity to connect one on one with Lindsay, I know at least I have like 10 or 15 <laughs> um, examples of follow up things that I think. Um, would be really smart strategic opportunities to connect. And now I'm gonna have Megan share some specific funder perspectives on ways that they've done so. So I'll turn things over to you, Megan. The Behavioral Health Partnership Grants uh, uh, came to be because of a collaboration between three funders and the Essex County Community Foundation, in addition to some other donors who are all interested in improving behavioral health outcomes in Essex County. Um, the majority of us have always had an interest in behavioral health, but we really came together or found the opportunity to come together because of the increased demand for services as a result of the pandemic. So in some ways, the pandemic gave us an opportunity to come together that we may not have um, seen previously. And the most rewarding part of that is to, to find out who, who among your colleagues are really interested in this work and figuring out ways that we can um, all come together around a common goal. And in this case, again, it's looking at the systems, uh, the behavioral health systems that exist in Essex County and finding ways, or, or I should say, and, and, and making resources available to the community so it can find ways to perhaps innovate and uh, further enhance a system that is in need of, of change. What's really, uh, important to this work is what we learn along the way. And we learn that cooperating and collaborating is not always easy and it takes a lot of time and you have to give a little bit. All of us that are coming together while we may be interested in behavioral health may have different objectives from our foundation standpoint in terms of what that means for our foundation. And they may be aligned but they may not be quite as aligned as maybe you would like. And so you give and you take all in service of that greater outcome. And in this case, for us, it would be an improved system of behavioral health care throughout Essex County, which would benefit those folks in need. The North Shore Community Health Network came together with ECCF and the Tower Foundation, among others, to create the Behavioral Health Partnership Grants. We realized in putting our resources towards this collaboration, that the issues were so significant and complex, and it was going to take a collaboration of not just resources, but also ideas, best practices, commitment, intent, in order for us to be able to have any kind of meaningful impact. The collaboration has been a very rewarding one, and we have really learned from one another and been able to exchange freely as we've continued along the road towards making these significant grants to improve behavioral health. We've really come to realize that collaboration accomplishes so much more than we could ever do exclusively on our own. Yeah, 
Thank you to Tracy and Bernadette for sharing your perspectives on that. Um, and I think for all of us as funders too, the key with this is the, sh the real shift in the collaboration as they both mentioned to the give and the take, um, focusing on the greater good, um, ensuring that you're adhering to the core principles of collaboration, um, collective goals, share communication, data, and then sort of sitting in the uncomfortableness of the evolution of these types of collaborations because they can be uncomfortable at times. They're not as linear and clear um, as other, um, you know, one funder direct funding. And so it's really important to sort of set that culture. And um, we've been so proud to partner with um, many, many partners here. And we just encourage folks to think about that um, as you explore the action, the call to action and next steps on the opportunities that we all have together. So we're gonna move into, um, next we're gonna move into uh, our breakout spaces where we're gonna have the opportunity to share together um, about the things that we're learning. I'm gonna share my screen here so that I can share the questions. You've been broken up into groups um, with a facilitator and we by design mixed the groups up so there's different funding opportunities as i said the unique piece of the funder summit is that we're bringing together individual institutional and donor advised funds together um, for these shared opportunities that we can potentially move out of the space with clear direct action and call to action on the opportunities that we could move forward so we're gonna magically move into these breakout rooms with a facilitator and we're gonna utilize probably about 20 minutes. Is that correct, Megan, at this point? 20 minutes um, to focus on these two questions. How can we show up as funders, individual and institutional and support efforts that come alongside public funding? So Lindsay spoke specifically to that um, and then speaking about where it's broken. Um, and then secondly, was there anything that you heard in today's presentation that has you thinking differently around equity? And if so, what? What got reinforced that you have been wavering on and what's missing that you think is important? I'm gonna ask Megan to move us magically into these breakout spaces. We will come back. We'll have about eight minutes, five to eight minutes to collectively share and then Beth and Tracy will wrap things up. Thank you everyone for sticking with us. I think we're all back here in the mainframe. Um, we, had a, we had a small group, but a really exciting and enriching opportunity to connect on these two key questions. Um, Megan and I will be making sure that we collect the notes and report back on the opportunities for collaboration. But I did want to open up the floor here to see if we can share out just popcorn style some of the things that folks learned in their breakouts. Is anyone willing to sort of jump in? Any of the group facilitators? I, I can jump in just a, a thing that a point that we talked about is um, providing support for the convening space and for the opportunity for um, the systems to come together or for local community organizing or organizations to learn from each other as to what's happening and what's going on in local communities um, that 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 strengthens the entire system if we can figure out ways in which we can do that collaboratively. Great. Was that reflected in other groups threads? The time and space for funding funding the time and space for convening rather. It was definitely reflected in our work as well. And just the acknowledgement of the partnership in, in our group, the importance of that partnership between the state and federal entities and those of us that are on the, on the ground, um, that interconnectedness and the opportunity to share in an upstream way, um, with the, the federal and state entities, the opportunities is really key to this work. And the continuation of flexing that muscle. Um, oh, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. 
Dr. Hoppingo. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I, I can go next. We had a, a, good, an, a group um, with three different um, funding identities in our group. So that was interesting. And I think a lot of the conversation um, actually bridged question one and two in a way, because a lot of our emphasis was around um, finding ways to partner with and identify smaller local grassroots, uh, perhaps people of color led nonprofits as a complement. Jonathan used the word complement to what state dollars might be doing and also as a way to address in the inequities that exist. Um, so I, there was just conversation about as a funder, how do you identify who those groups are? How do you find out about them? And kind of lessening some of the burden that might go along with accepting public dollars, private dollars can be more nimble um, and flexible. We talked about that too. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Validation. <laughs> Validation. Yeah. And, and I know Lindsay spoke to the, um, the surveying they did, they do in like the examples of the vaccine work and, and others. But another thing I'm really curious about is getting down to the individual level. I know right now bar and HRIA are doing a big analysis or a big community-wide effort where they're going into all of the communities to engage, um, and this was all for ARPA money, but there is public health resonance here to engage people at the community level, not just organizations, but people mm -hmm. um, to pull that information into the whole infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, for me, the biggest key missing piece here is how do you do that effectively? We should probably wrap up. I can't believe it's almost 1130. My goodness. <laughs> I know. So thank you all for sharing your thoughts and feedback. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna turn things back over to the captains of our ship here, Tracy and Beth, and um, have them wrap up. Great. Well, it, this has been a really terrific morning. Um, I don't know about you, but I found Lindsay to be just very casual. I know I said Lindsay, but um, she was just that approachable. I mean, her, her, her sharing of information was so spot on and so crystal clear and certainly gave us a lot to think about. So I'm really happy that we were all able to hear it together and then to have this conversation. So as we do every time we pull these together is to leave us all with challenges, right? What is our call to action? And so some of our calls to action today is to you know continue to think about what we heard today, continue to ponder these questions that we asked and how does it, how does it show or how, how do you think about this in your day-to-day -day work? How about if you connect with somebody that you don't know here that you might wanna, you know, you heard them say something or that you've been interested in seeing what they're thinking about this. You know, Bernadette and I have had the opportunity, you got to see us on the big screen as they say, but working together um, has given us a real opportunity to get to know each other, but also to think about our work differently. And um, that's always inspiring. So we invite all of you to do that. Um, and again, it might even spark you to rethink your strategies. I mean, you know, we have these conversations at Tower all the time. I'm sure you do as well, but you know, it's not all or nothing. So maybe there's an opportunity for you to try something experimental, something that makes you a little uncomfortable or a little bit different. And there's another funder that's doing it already. Join us or join them. So again, we're, it's a call to action. And then ultimately, I think, you know, um, thinking really deeply about the organizations that are in the community that don't always... Um, show up on our lists, I think is something that really resonates with me. And I invite us to all, you know, be mindful. It's really to overlook some of those organizations that are out there because they're not in our circle. And in philanthropy, we're, we're one ring outside of the work often. And so again, just, just invite you to think about different organizations um, that you might be able to engage with. And Beth, I'm gonna turn it over to you with probably more call to actions. Yeah, no, I just, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, you know, today's really about networking and hearing from our peers. It's about listening to each other and what's happening um, around the region. It's learning something new, um, but it's also like 
helping us think differently, right? That's that's the intent of why we do these um, these funder summits. So thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you'll take one of those three things along with you. I'd particularly like to thank again, so Philanthropy Massachusetts has been a terrific partner um, in producing um, these funder summits and engaging the, um, the funders that they work with. Just wanna say thanks to Jessica um, and wanna say thanks to Tracy who, Actually, the Tower Foundation has been very generous. Those vignettes that you that you saw today, well, it takes resources to put those together and time in order for that to do that to make this a meaningful space. So I just want to say thank the Tower Foundation who supports that with their financial dollars to do this. So we use our convening power to bring folks together and it's a great um, triad. And I just want to say thank you. We don't do that enough, I think, to each other. So appreciate it. Um, that's it. Have a wonderful day. Um, we hope to put together, we really hope that this next time we get together, we can be back live and in person. Um, and so we, um, we will reach out probably later in the fall to plan our next one. We do these twice a year. Um, so we'll, we'll be reaching back out, thinking and talking to everyone who cares about Essex County about what topics might be of interest um, as we put together the next one um, as a collective group. So it was wonderful to see you all. Thank you. Some old friends and some new friends. Jean, it was nice to meet you. Um, but thanks for joining us.